Roll back 44 years to a forest in Suffolk, England, known as the Rendlesham Forest. It's a very cold December night, 1980. And on that night, two airmen doing security work at the adjacent RAF Bentwaters base, a base largely controlled by the Americans, a nuclear base with nuclear weapons. They're on patrol and they're sent into the forest to investigate some kind of object that's been seen to land in the adjacent Rendlesham Forest. What they see that night becomes one of the most compelling UAP military sightings mysteries of all time anywhere in the world. It was very well recorded because the deputy base commander of the base, Colonel Charles Holt, had the presence of mind to do a memo which recorded exactly what he saw two nights later when yet again another unidentified object was seen to land in the Rendlesham Forest and he and his patrol witnessed something quite extraordinary. And he was so compelled to report what he saw, he wrote it down in a memo, found its way into the British military archives, and that was miraculously eventually declassified. I interviewed Colonel Holt in April 2009 for Channel 7 Australia. And what he told me stunned me. He was a man one rank below a general revealing what he believed was a conspiracy by the US military and the British military to conceal what was clearly some kind of intelligently controlled, highly technologically advanced object moving through a forest immediately adjacent to a base crammed full of dangerous nuclear weapons. Why on earth would the Americans and the British want to suppress such an incident? There's a great story told by an author called Georgia Bruni, and she tells of how she met the British Prime Minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher, and she asked her about the Rendlesham Forest incident. What happened? She asked the Prime Minister. Margaret Thatcher leaned across to her at a dinner party and said, You can't tell the people. Well, 44 years on, so that's nearly half a century on, we still don't know what really happened in the Rendlesham Forest. But Colonel Charles Holt's account is one of the most compelling. And here it is, in its entirety, what I recorded 15 years ago, so forgive the loss of hair since. This is what Charles Holt told me in 2009. I find it compelling, and I hope you do too. Colonel, take me back to 1980, Rendlesham. What was your role in RAF Bentwater? In 1980, I was assigned to RAF Bentwaters, actually the twin base complex, we call it, Bentwaters Woodbridge, as a deputy base commander. The base commander cut ribbons, kissed babies, shook hands, and did the public relations and so forth, and set the policy. And it was my job to see that it was all properly administered and that all the various functions in the base worked properly. And your background in, in the previous years in the Air Force, give us an idea of your CV, your, your uh, resume as an officer. Well, I had a master's degree in business management and an undergraduate degree in economics and chemistry. I'd been in the Air Force at that time approximately 18 years. I'd worked uh, just about every imaginable job. And in fact, prior to that, I had been in the Pentagon on a special assignment. So you're a respected senior officer in the US Air Force? I would like to think so. Up until that point, had you ever been criticized adversely, the subject of any hostility from inside the military in a, in a way that reflected on your capacity to do your job as an officer? No, none whatsoever. So tell me what happened. Actually, what happened was I normally, in the course of my job, would go about interfacing with the various squadrons and agencies on the base. Quite often on the way to work in the morning, I would leave a little early and I would go by the the police station and talk to the desk sergeant, the desk sergeant being the gentleman who was behind the desk to kept the, the police blotter, the chronological listing of what happened and kind of dispatch the police, etc. And I would normally collect the police blotters and bring them up to the office. And my boss and I would just glance through them to see if anything had happened the previous night that we didn't know about or we needed to take any action on. The particular morning in question, I walked into the police station and I knew the desk sergeant well because he'd been there for at least a year maybe. Uh, it was Crash McCabe, and I said to him, Sergeant McCabe, what's going on? And he started laughing. Well, that was a bit unusual. So, so what's so funny? He said, 
Well, Burroughs and Cabana Sack and Penniston were out in the woods chasing UFOs all night last night. And uh, the lieutenant said, don't put anything in the blotter. I said, UFOs? I was quite interested. What do you mean? And what did they see? He said, well, I don't know. He said, but lights, I know that. I said, uh, well, you've got to put something in the blotter. You need to document it if there was activity and they were out in the woods off the base. So he put something into the effect that they saw lights or did some such thing. And I didn't give it too much thought. I thought there was an explanation. I collected the blotters and took them up to the office. We looked at them. We kind of had a chuckle. Yeah, there's, I'm sure there's something to this. Can I ask you this, sir, at this stage? Before this incident, had you ever in your time at Bent Waters ever been alerted to similar types of sightings? No. No. So what happened next? Uh, later that day, it became apparent that there was an awful lot of, how should we say, gossip talk amongst the security police that there were UFOs in the woods, et cetera, et cetera. And there was some concern that uh, our police people, primarily the police, were being distracted from their primary mission. Uh, this continued the build for the next day or two, and two nights later, we were having the end of the year banquet recognition dinner for various people in the combat support group. In other words, recognizing people for their accomplishments or achievements and longevity, whatever. And we, it was a family affair. It was a covered dish dinner, and we had had some, some nice meal. And we just finished dinner. I'm getting ready for dessert when the on-duty flight lieutenant, the security police squadron, came in white as a sheet. And he said, I've got to see you two to, right now. It's important. And so we went into the cloakroom. It was the only private place in, in the little building we were in. And he said, it's back. What's back? He said, the UFO is back. Well, the base commander and I looked at each other in disbelief. And he said, oh, what, did, what did you see, Bruce? And he said, we saw something out in the forest we can't explain. He said, okay. So the base commander had to make the presentation. So he said, you go out and put this thing to rest, find out what's going on. So he attended to the rest of the function that evening and I went home and changed clothes. Prior to leaving, I talked to the security police commander and said, I want one of your senior people to go with me. And I talked to the disaster preparedness officer and I said, who's your standby person? And they told me it was Sergeant Nevels. I said, call Sergeant Nevels and have him meet me at the office. I want him to bring his camera and to pick up an APN-27. I took those things along just to disprove all of this stuff. What is an APN-27? APN-27 is a military gagger kind of, in essence. Now, you say you went in with the intention of trying to disprove. Were you a natural skeptic about I planes? was a skeptic. I was going to show there was no radiation. There's nothing we, you know, I was going to take pictures. There's nothing there. And we're going to put this all to rest and get on with business. So what did you find? Well, when we got out to the forest, they picked me up in a Jeep and I collect the Sergeant Nevels and a, and a Geiger counter, if you will, in the camera. And four of us rode across the base and out the back gate of Bentwaters into Woodbridge, across Woodbridge Base. We went to the east gate, out the east gate, and there out in the forest on a forest service road were three or four NF2 NF light alls, which are motor generators with big lights on top. Sort of like you see at a construction site at night. And you'd ask for these to be brought out? No, I didn't ask for anything to be brought out. And I was very concerned because there were probably 20 or 30 security policemen out there. And I'm thinking, here we are in the, the Queen's Forest in the middle of the night, really trespassing. We don't belong out here. There's something strange going on. I was quite concerned that we would be embarrassed by this whole incident. So who point. had brought those light generators out? Apparently the flight commander from the security police squadron. And he probably had this whole crew of people out there. And I was extremely concerned. And they had a, a starlight scope. First generation, very primitive compared to today's standards. That's a night, night vision scope. Yes. Big scope. Because we used them in the weapon storage area to look around if the power went off. So what happened next? They said, look into the forest there. That certain area has a dull glow to it. So I looked in and through the greenish yellow tint in the starlight scope, I could see an area that was brightly illuminated compared to the other areas. So that that's where the object was. What object was? The one that Penniston, Burroughs, and Cabanasac had seen two nights earlier. So we put the scope down and we went into the forest and they took me to a site that they said they identified as this is where the object supposedly had landed or whatever two nights prior. So I said, well, careful, don't step in the indentations. There were three indentations equal distance apart. And we looked at them, we marked them. And at that time I was using my little Lanier cassette recorder because I normally carried it in my pocket anyhow. And when I went around to base and just to take notes, versus just having to carry a pencil and a paper or a notebook. <clears throat> so I made some notes and we were there examining and Sergeant Nevels was taking readings with the APN-27 or the Geiger counter. And just take me through very slowly. Let's talk first about the indentations. Why are you so sure that those markings are indentations? 
Why aren't they what some of the skeptics said were rabbit holes or animal marks? Well, the, the soil there was hard packed sand with pine needles and some pine bark. The indentations were about that deep and about that big around. <clears throat> we measured them. They were all equal distance apart. And this area in between, the center of formed by this triangle, was a bit scruffed up. So it gave you the impression of being a very recently formed indentation? Yes, definitely. And Could it have been a rabbit hole? No, they weren't holes. They were just nice, smooth indentations, all identical. You'd be familiar with the claims of the local groundskeeper, the gamekeeper, that, that oh, Mr. Thurkettle, that uh, in, in some way that they might have been explained away as just simple animal holes. A hens nesting, rabbits burrowing. Well, it'd be interesting to see a rabbit burrow that way. Rabbits make holes, they certainly do, and hens do nest. Uh, the odds of them making a perfectly symmetrical triangle because we did measure them. They were all equal distance apart and it was just perfectly placed. Now, is it possible that this was an elaborate hoax? We're at the Christmas period, maybe a few blokes are having a few drinks. Could the whole thing have been an elaborate practical joke? Well, up until that point, I was thinking there had to be a logical explanation, not necessarily a joke. I did find out later that one of the security policemen concocted a bogus landing site near the one that I was taken to. This was done a day or two later. I'm told, I, do, I didn't go there, I don't know. <clears throat> but there was definitely something there and we found radiation, about 10 times normal background radiation. So you're quite sure that it was anomalous levels of radiation? Yes, definitely abnormal levels of radiation, not high enough at that point to have been dangerous. Now you're a, a trained military officer, you're aware of what's anomalous background radiation. Even though your detectors, I understand, were not entirely appropriate for that kind of measurement, are you confident that it was more than background levels of radiation? Definitely, because I had been through the Air Force Disaster Preparedness School and spent quite a, quite a bit of time in the classroom and actual practical experience using that very instrument and similar instruments and you know, calculating wind speeds, drift, and radiation patterns. And So you've had training in how you use radiation yes. meters, yes. and you, you can be sure that the levels of radiation you were witnessing were, were above normal levels. In addition, I'd had an extensive background in physics in high school and college. Okay, we're standing in the clearing. You're looking at the indentations. What else do you see? We saw marks on the trees that could, could have been blaze marks, I'm told. They could have been rub marks, I don't know. But one thing was interesting is if you would look up from the site directly above, there was a heavy canopy of pine branches, but it was completely clear directly over that site. So it looked as if something had descended. It looked that as period. if something had come down. And I, I still was very, very skeptical and convinced that, at that point that there had to be a good explanation that some, yes, something could have happened, but. Can I check this point with you, sir? One assertion that I've read is that there were higher radiation readings on the sides of the trees where the branches were broken. That, that is correct. On the side of the trees facing the triangle formed by the three indentations. And that is confirmed by the tape, the audio tape that you made yes, as well. Yes, it's on the tape too. Right. Whilst you were making your recollections on the audio tape, as with those kinds of dictaphones, you're stopping and starting, aren't you? Certainly, because I only had 30 minutes of tape. I didn't know how long we were going to be out there, and it was very common. I would talk, turn it off, talk, turn it off. So just to be clear, whereas some people have written that there appear to be edits in your tape, what that is, is it, is you turning the recording button on and off. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's entirely consistent with that type of dictaphone? Yes. Right. So I, well, Even when I used it in the office, that's what I'd do. If I would dictate a letter, I would pick that up, I would talk a little bit, then I would either collect my thoughts or maybe do some research or maybe telephone call or something, then click it back on and finish the correspondence. And when I would get done, I would give a little micro cassette to the secretary and she would type up Right. Before we go on to what happened next, paint me a, a word picture of the type of night we're seeing. Is this a foggy night? Is it a clear night? No, this is a very clear, cold night. Temperatures were just above freezing. There was a light breeze coming off the coast. It was extremely cold. I had a heavy field jacket on and I was, I was cold. I had a pair of gloves too. Now, as the deputy base commander, you obviously know about the nearby lighthouse with the flashing beacon. Are you aware at this stage where the lighthouse is? Oh, certainly. I've been out to Orford and asked many times where the, the lighthouse sits on an island at Orford. And yes, I was very familiar with it. So we, when you saw something later in the evening, were you aware that you were distinguishing whatever it was that you were seeing from the lighthouse? Yes, very clearly. 
What did the lighthouse look like? Uh, the lighthouse was a flashing beacon, a rotating beacon. It was a whitish, uh, whitish yellow light, whereas the object I saw was bright orangish red like fire. Well, let's go to that object now. When did you first see the object? The first thing I saw out of the ordinary, we were standing at the site measuring and taking radiation readings and trying to ascertain what was it, you know, what had happened here. When I looked up and looked through the forest uh, toward the coast and saw a glowing object. I can best describe it as looking something like an eye with a black center. The object at first initially was very stable still, but it was the equivalent of dripping molten metal. Something was shedding off it and dripping onto the ground. Now, presumably you looked underneath the object subsequently. Was there anything on the ground? No, I looked later because the object was out in the field. Keep in mind, we were in the forest at this time. One thing that really concerned me is it was a farmer's house out there. Uh, the object was between us and the farmer's house and the reflection from the object was like the, just like a burning, blazing fire in the farmer's house. I was quite concerned because it wasn't too far from the house. And I thought, I was concerned about the safety of the people in the house. Just for my own information, did you find out subsequently whether there were people in the house that night? We don't know. I didn't knock on the door. Keep in mind, this is to, uh, wee hours of the morning. Here we are, military uniform, you know, in a, in a foreign country, even though it's a very friendly foreign country. I made everybody stay as quiet as possible, tried to do this as low profile as possible, didn't want to draw attention to us. Just to explain for the purposes of our viewers' understanding, as I understand it, you as the deputy base commander had pretty much autonomy control over the American base. What were the rules about venturing out of the base? We didn't go off the base with weapons except under certain circumstances. And we could, trans by weapons, I'm talking about a, a sidearm or an M16 between the two bases. And when we did, we had constant radio contact and had a patrol escort, et cetera. We were very sensitive about moving any weapons in, in the, you know, the, the British territory. Uh, we would normally call for British PC support or ask them to investigate anything off the base unless it were a threat to the aircraft or the system. Now, why didn't you do that that night? Why didn't you just call the British police? Well, by the time I got involved, the, our people were already out there. You know, it was one of those things that you're beyond the point of return. And I was told that the PCs had no interest and that they had come earlier and said, oh, it's nothing but chickens and hens. Now, before we go into the detail of what you saw, the light alls, the big, I think they're generator powered yeah, illuminating NF2, lights. Yeah, we call them. It's nothing but a gasoline engine, four cycle gasoline engine, a generator and two big lights. Now, were they functioning? No, they were having great difficulties with them. They wouldn't work, operate properly. They kept cutting off. And there was some chatter that, you know, the, the individual was supposed to have fueled them before they came out, didn't do the proper job, didn't fill them up with fuel. However, well, I heard conversation then that, yes, he had, and they checked him, there was fuel in them. Were you ever able to resolve why it was that those lights weren't able to work? No, because way? I didn't pay much attention to the lights. I was more concerned to put this thing to rest, and get everybody back on the base as fast as possible. Now, you were also, as I understand, in constant walkie-talkie communication with the base. Were those walkie-talkies working correctly? Yes, to a certain extent. We actually had, I had th uh, three security policemen with me in Sergeant Neville's. The policemen were on two different frequencies, security frequency, law enforcement frequency, and I was on a command post network. So there were three different frequencies. Uh, we, we had constant interference on the radios. Was there any explanation for the interference? No. Have you ever had interference like that before? Well, I've had uh, 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 drop signals, but I know. But normally I didn't go out into the forest with them. Normally I operated on the base. And there were a few spots on the base, or if you went into the command post, which was a hardened shelter with a lot of concrete, they obviously wouldn't work without an external antenna. But it, it's your proposition, though, that the, the light, the generator lights, and also the walkie-talkies were behaving oddly that they night. They were behaving very irrationally, I guess is the best way to put it, infrequently. Did you they notice were, anything about the local animals? I understand that there were animals yes. in the farm. In fact, that's on my tape. We, at one point, we heard the animals go, how shall I say, highly uh, excited in a frenzy almost. When you say highly excited, what do you mean? Well, they're, they're bellowing and, and crowing and making unusual noises, so they were agitated. When did you first see this object? Take me back to when you first okay, saw it. Okay, we were standing at the location of the three indentations, making notes and taking readings and trying to decide what to do and what we had there. And we marked the position one, two, three, and we're <clears throat> wandering around and looking for any other evidence of anything. 
Suddenly I noticed, or somebody, I don't remember who noticed the object, the glowing object out in the field. How far away was it? Oh, probably 150 or 200 meters, maybe a little bit more than that. Look, I'll put this to you. Was it an optical illusion? How can you be sure that what you saw wasn't an optical illusion, your mind playing tricks with itself? Well, at first I didn't know what it was, and, and it was fairly stationary, and I was thinking perhaps there's some type of the, you know reflection off the clouds or some such thing. Were there clouds? No, there were no clouds. That's the interesting thing. I was trying, try, I was looking around trying to find an explanation, already thinking this is this is very unusual. <clears throat> when the object started moving toward us, it moved for, forward from the field into the forest. We're probably 75 or 100 meters back in the forest at this point. It's moving like this through the trees going up and down, avoiding the trees. You then, use the word there, avoiding the trees. You're under the clear impression that this object was intelligently moving? Definitely. It was under some type of intelligent control. So It had to be because, or some way to avoid the trees. Then it came toward us at one point, started toward us, and then it receded. It went away. It went back out into the field and stayed out into the field for, I don't know, maybe 10, 20, 30 seconds. And silently, it went, exploded into white objects. And they just disappeared. How big was the object? The best way I can describe it is probably about the size of a football, maybe a little larger. Could have been, could have been bigger than that. It was hard to tell because you couldn't see a clear shape. You could see the light. Now, you've described a light, but you've also described something that looked like an eye. The center, I said, it's red, say this big, and then it had a black center. That's why I say like an eye. And the black center, uh, would sort of like wink a little bit. You've referred to a, a beam. Describe the beam. Actually, while we were out in the field, we went out into the field after the object disappeared, and we're searching around with our flashlights or torches, as you call them, looking for some evidence because obviously something was dripping off this object or appeared to be. And I thought there have to be some, some slag, some residue, something on the ground or some burn marks or something. And the only thing we find is evidence that there been cattle there. We didn't find anything at all. And while we're out there searching around, we saw objects in the sky to the north. What were they? They were bright objects. They, were, they changed shape from half moon to elliptical to full circles. How far away were they? Probably, oh, several miles out and up about 30 degrees. At that point, I called back on the radio to the command post and gave them an area to look at and said, call Eastern Radar. Eastern Radar had air defense for that sector and have them you know, focus their radar and see what they can find in this area and see if they can find anything. And they came back and said they couldn't find anything. Okay. The objects at this stage that you're describing are at a considerable distance. What height would they have been at? Oh, probably several thousand feet, maybe, maybe four or five thousand feet, maybe a little higher. What speeds were they moving at? Very high speed. And it's interesting, they were sort of synchronized and they would move in sharp angular movements as though they were doing a grid search or something. That's the only way I can equate it. It, it didn't make any sense to me, and I'm, I'm very puzzled at this point. Then we turned and looked. Somebody saw one to the south, and then another one to the south. The one to the south that was closest to us came almost directly overhead at very high speed and stopped, and it was stationary. How far above you was it? Uh, several thousand feet, probably. At least a thousand feet, maybe more. Again, what are we seeing? I'm just seeing a bright light. What color was it? It was white. What happens? We're standing there in awe, and all of a sudden, a beam came down right to the side of us. Now, it was an interesting beam. It was concentrated. It did not radiate. It came down like this, sort of like a laser, I would say today. In those days, I you know, wasn't that familiar with lasers. I mean, I knew of them, but they weren't very common. And it, it, the object illuminated a spot on the ground about 10 or 12 feet away. And we were stood there in awe at that point. And I'm thinking, is this a warning? Is this communication? Is this... What is this, you know? What do we do now? And just as abruptly as it came on, click, it went off. It's quite clear from what you're saying that you believe that that object was intelligently guided. Definitely. Why do you say that? Because how else would it be controlled and then turn a beam on and focus near us? At the same time, the other object was sending down beams and according to the radio correspond or communication, that the lights, the other object was sending beams down near our weapon storage area. So explain, what, what was the object doing? Just sending down a beam of light. Now, was it probing? 
I don't know what it was doing. I mean, have you ever seen anything within the technology of the United States or British military that could explain what you saw that night? No. Is there anything? No, I've seen laser technology at a later date that's very interesting. Did that explain what you saw that night? Well, I just equate it to a laser because, that's the, because it didn't radiate. That's the only reason I say that. Well, from the speeds that you saw, could a human being have survived any movements in such a craft? No, I don't in... believe so. The force of gravity would have been just too great. So the, <clears throat> the type of movement that you saw defied inertia, our understanding of inertia. Yes, for a normal person, yes. After, <laughs> after eight, nine, or 10 Gs, people have serious problems. I've experienced it, I can tell you. Your vision goes, everything goes. So the object that was above you at 1,000 feet, was that still the size of the football-sized object you'd seen in the forest? I, I could say it probably. I can't tell for sure. It was a, a, a big, bright spot. Were all of the objects that you saw of a consistent size around the football size that you've described? Probably. I can't say for sure because the ones we saw to the north were pretty far away. What's happening on the radio? Are you reporting back to the base at this stage what you're seeing? Yes. Intermittently as something happens or as I have a requirement, I'm calling back to the command post. So it was all on the tape at the command post. How many witnesses were there to what you saw that night? The five of us that are out in the field at that point. Now, the people that are behind us probably saw it too. I can't say for sure. I did never went back and ask every one of them. I don't even know who they all were for sure. But crucially, this is an incident that's witnessed by maybe a dozen people? Probably a total of 30 or 40 people. And were all of their accounts reasonably consistent about what they saw that night? Yes. In fact, later I found out that the tire operator at the, at the Bentwaters WSA, that's the control tire inside the weapon storage area, on duty saw th things too. And a communications man was up there working on the communications equipment, and he also saw the, ish the, uh, the lights. Could it have been some kind of Soviet spy technology? I don't think they had any technology that was that far beyond anything we had at that time. Have you seen anything in any realm of human technology that explains what you saw that night? No, nothing. I'd certainly like some answers. And yet you clearly believe that what you saw was intelligent. Or intelligently controlled, yes. So you're quite sure that what you saw wasn't a natural phenomenon? No, it definitely was not a natural phenomenon. Let's address what the skeptics would say. The skeptics would say that all of you went out into the forest with the, if you like, programming of what you'd heard around the base of what had been seen the previous two nights previously. I put it to you that what you and your men did was, as the psychologists say, you completed the bottom-up information with top-down information. You filled in the patterns that you could see and your mind played tricks with itself. I, I, I don't believe that. Keep in mind, there's a large group of people, people that are very skeptical. Uh, Bobby Ball that was with me was very skeptical of the whole thing. Sergeant Nevels was skeptical of the whole thing. Now, Bruce England, who was with us, had been out there earlier that evening and obviously had some things implanted in his mind and probably did have some, some issues to deal with. But, uh, and we were talking to people on three different radio nets at three different locations and the people in the WSA are seeing things. So you're an open-minded bloke, aren't you? You're a skeptic. Oh, yes. yes. So I've never said I saw a UFO. I hate to use that term because of the, the, what it connotates. I saw a lot of things I couldn't explain that night. What do you think it was? It was something under intelligent control. I, I don't know. I would like to have answers. Were you scared? I, I was very concerned. In fact, I had a friend take the tape. I did a small tape and do voice stress analysis on it. A gentleman by the name of Chuck DiCaro had it done by the folks that uh, did the Watergate tapes, for instance. And he said the stress level went extremely high at certain points on the tape. Was your heart rate up? Yes, definitely. Now, did we did not cower down and run. When we saw the objects in the field, somebody said at one point, well, you know, you cowered down and you ran. I was very concerned, but I said, we had an obligation. We need to go forward and find out what this is. Did you have a feeling about if it was intelligent, whether it was hostile or friendly? 
No, I, I, I was kind of neutral. Except when the beam came down, I thought here's certain this could be certainly a, a weapon or something hostile or some type of a warning. Okay. What happened after the point when the, the object shone the beam down in front of you? Then the object moved away. The objects that were in the north stayed in the sky. We, at that point, were very tired, wet, cold. We'd stumbled through a stream across from the farmer's field and gotten all wet. And it was a miserable night. It was getting very early in the morning, and we went back to the base. Were you all talking about what you'd seen? There was great concern that we should even say anything about what we'd seen, but we had no choice because we'd talked on the radio to three different control centers. So in other words, the word was out. We were out in the woods. We'd seen something unusual. and couldn't explain it. So it was obviously, you know, in the public domain, I guess the best way to put it. Why was there concern about whether you should even talk about what you'd seen? Well, there's a stigma that goes with this sort of thing. That it's difficult to under, understand unless you've been, I guess, a, a victim or a participant, if you will. Have you often regretted since this incident ever speaking about it? Well, when the tape or when the memo actually became somewhat common knowledge and the Air Force was going to release it, I asked them not to. In fact, I specifically asked the third or acting third Air Force commander at that time, who I knew well, to destroy it and do not release it. Because I said, my life and yours won't be the same and I don't need any more of this. Let's go back, though, to the investigation that you did. What did you decide to do after that night? After that night, I reported it. I ran into my boss the following morning in the foyer of the office, and he had heard enough of the conversation on the radio between the command post and I, and they obviously had called him once all this started and let him, him in, and all the senior officers were listening in on the radio, I can tell you. Uh, he, asked me for the, he asked me to describe what happened. I walked him through the whole scenario, and I, he said, may I have the tape? I gave him the tape. He took the tape to the third or fourth staff meeting the following Wednesday, and played it for the staff. Including General? Baisley. And General Baisley was the commander, Land Forces? Third Air Force commander at that time in England. So a very senior officer. Yes. And the, he asked the staff for their response, what to do, and I guess the staff was silent. And so his response, according to my boss, was that, well, it happened off the base, that the British should take care of it. So when he brought the tape back and gave it back to me, I said, well, what do I do? He kind of laughed, sort of like, you know, I don't want to keep this away from me. You know, nobody wanted near it. He said, get with Squadron Leader Moreland, who was the liaison officer from the RAF, who, by the way, was on holiday in Wales at that time. Get with him, see what he wants to do, and make a report. So I waited till he came back, and he and I talked, and he was quite alarmed. He contacted his superiors, and they said, well, give us a memo. So I wrote the infamous memo and gave it to him. I thought that would be the end of it. I really expected the British MOD to send somebody to interview me and at least take a look. I, you know, days went by, weeks went by, and I thought, oh well. At some... C Colonel, you then commenced an investigation, and you were aware, obviously, that two nights previous to your sighting, one of, some of your men had actually seen an object, hadn't they? Yes. What did you do? I called them in. I had, you know, some great concerns and I really wanted some more information. I called them all in independently, one at a time. Who, who were these men? Uh, Bobby Ball, actually was with me. Uh, J.D. Chandler, who had been the senior supervisor, a master sergeant, who had stayed at the East Gate. Uh, Jim Penniston, John Burroughs, Ed Cabanasack, and uh, Skip Baran, who was a lieutenant in the security police squadron. Uh, I'm trying to think who else I got a statement. That's from. fine. Let's take. To, let's just deal firstly with Jim Penniston's account. You interviewed Jim. What did he tell you? Well, Jim didn't want to talk about it at first. Jim was extremely nervous, very, very concerned for his career, and was, how shall I say, uh, quite upset about the whole incident. Up until that point, what were your impressions of Jim Penniston as a soldier? Very, 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 very favorable. I had worked with him in the command post during numerous exercises. He was a, usually was a security police liaison into the, my unit in the command post when we would get cooped up for days at a time. So let's hypothetically assume, obviously you're not telling us this, but if Bent Waters was holding nuclear weapons, he'd be the sort of person who'd be entrusted with the custody of whatever it was inside Ref Bent Waters. Uh, one could say that. A very credible person? Very credible person. What did he tell you? 
He told me that he didn't thought he saw a donned aircraft from the lights he saw from the East Gate. He and two of his compadres, which I've mentioned their names, went out to investigate, and they came across a strange craft. That's what he told me. Is the craft that Jim Penniston described to you the same as the one that you saw? I don't know. The reason I say that is he saw a very clear physical object, according to him. Triangular, he had dimensions, he had taken pictures, he had taken his notebook out and made notes of the inscriptions on the side of the object. He had actually physically touched the object. This is all according to him in his statement, and he drew a sketch for me of what he saw. And more importantly, he, he told you what he'd seen and described that object to you within a couple of days of the incident. That's correct. And he referred to the hieroglyphics on the side of the object? He certainly did. And, and at that point, I didn't know he had a notebook that he had written him down. And he just told me he had made notes of it. How did he impress you at the time? Uh, very, very upset. He wanted to get away from the base for a while. He actually went on leave just to kind of get away from things. Had he been interrogated by anyone else prior to you talking to him? At that time, I did not know that that he had been interrogated. Just prior to my talking to him, or very soon thereafter, I don't know the exact timeline, he and four or five, actually five other, four other people, said independently that they were taken by the Office of Security and Special Investigations with some other people involved, including some British people, and they were interrogated, and they were given drugs, and they were hypnotized. Do you believe that? Yes. There's no doubt in your mind? There's no doubt in my mind. Why are you so sure? Because they all independently told me that. Is this an investigation that preceded yours? It was going on uh, at the same time, apparently. And yet you're the deputy base commander and you didn't know this. Well, you have to understand there are a lot of things that are done, how shall I say, under the cloak of secrecy that aren't talked about. <laughs> that was not uncommon. The OSI did a lot of things that they probably wouldn't like to uh, have come to the light of day. So these men are independently interrogated. What, what was the drug that they were given? I don't know what the drug was. They told me it was an injection. I, won't, I would only have to guess it would be sodium pentothal or something equivalent. A truth drug? Yes. Is it within the purview of the OSI at that time to do that kind of thing? You'd have to ask the OSI. I would certainly think not, however. But you're in no doubt whatsoever that there was interrogations and that yes. what these men are telling you is And what the truth. I think the intent was to get, how should I say, the full story from them. And I strongly suspect to plant some false memories to put out this information, to make the story so ridiculous. That's why I think that one of the participants, uh, excuse me, one of the wannabe participants who got grabbed up in this was meddled with so badly and told such a bizarre story about little green men and clouds of smoke and we repairing this downed craft with components from our avionics shop and all. In other words, you make it so ridiculous that everybody laughs and says, oh, that. Very good trick. Works. But let's talk about what Jim Penniston saw. Jim Penniston told you, didn't he, that he saw a craft. That's correct. With inscriptions on the side. That's, he did. And when you're and he did a to drawing, him, and I've you know I have the drawing. And when you're talking to him and he's telling you this, did you find him credible? Yes, I find him very upset. Was his account corroborated by the other people that you interviewed? To a certain extent, by John Burroughs, yes. What apparently did John, John tell Apparently, him? John wasn't as close to the object as as Peniston. That's I, the only conclusion I can draw. But keep in mind, I think they were they were all hypnotized and at some point meddled with a little bit. By U.S. government investigators? By certain agencies. Now, you're a colonel in the U.S. Air Force, retired. Your own military is capable of this kind of thing? Unfortunately, I, I, I think so. You interrogated these men. At the end of it, did you reach a conclusion? Yes, that there was something we couldn't explain. And it was obvious to me that there was no interest on the part of the British government after a very short period of time. My superiors didn't want to be involved in it. It certainly wasn't career enhancing, so I didn't pursue it too awfully far. Can I ask you this though, sir? If this was a nuclear weapons facility, and even if it wasn't, it was certainly a defence security issue, wasn't it? I would certainly think so. 
Were you surprised by the reluctance of the British and American investigators to take the issue further? Yes, to, very surprised. I expected a lot of activity, and I won't go into the details to what I expected, but I expected a lot of activity. Have you ever had any explanation for why it didn't go any further? I think the, the issue was that the, the powers to be did not want it to become public knowledge. And why do you or think if that it was? became public knowledge to be so ridiculous that it would be spoofed and laughed off. You're convinced that there was something there that night? I'm firmly convinced there was something there that night. One thing I haven't put to you properly is the skeptics suggest that on your tape, the audio of your description of the frequency of the light, there was a flashing light, wasn't there, on the object that you were seeing. Can you describe that flashing light? Uh, the flashing light was actually, the object was, I say winking, blinking, whatever. Now, I can't say that Bruce Englund is the one that says there's the light, there's the light or something. I can't say that at that point he wasn't looking at the lighthouse. I don't know what he was looking at. But was I was looking at a red object in front of the farmer's house. Okay, but let's, let's talk about what you saw. Let's go with your first person knowledge. Did you see a flashing strobing light on the unexplained object? No, all I saw was equivalent of a winking is the best I can describe. It's sort of like the center of the eye uh, moved a little bit. Is it the case that the winking that you saw matched the frequency of the flashing of the lighthouse? I don't know because at that point I didn't, you know, I was not correlating the flashing light at the lighthouse because I was ignoring the lighthouse. The lighthouse was a beam that was there. So, so let's just go back a bit. You had seen a winking on the object. The That's correct. unexplained object. On the tape, there is a voice where the voice reports seeing a flashing light. That would be Bruce England. That's not you. No, that's not me. So is it possible that when Bruce England was describing a flashing light, he was actually looking at the lighthouse? That's certainly possible. I don't know because I have no idea what he was looking at. So when the skeptics make much of the frequency of the light that's flashing matching the frequency of the lighthouse, that's not the light that you're describing. No. I was ignoring the lighthouse. You knew where the lighthouse I, oh, was? Yes, I saw the lighthouse. There's no doubt in your mind. No, about I used to go out to the pub in Orford. There's a very good pub that had fantastic food out there and with good prices. Used to go out there and have dinner from time to time. And I've been on Orford Island where the lighthouse is. So the lighthouse light flashing away separately was completely distinguishable from what you were seeing? That's correct. Okay, let's go back to the post-incident investigation that you did. You interrogated all of these men and it slowly became clear to you that there'd been or there was an ongoing investigation that you didn't know about. At that time, I didn't know there was one. I had suspicions. So I confronted the OSI commander, who was a friend of mine, and said, do you have any interest? Are you involved in this? And he said, none whatsoever, which was a blatant lie. And I believed him at that time until I found out through later events and the people that were involved started talking a little more freely as time passed. Why would he lie to you? Oh, well, because the, probably the classification of it was probably so highly compartmentalized and it just it wasn't going to get common knowledge. At that point, I don't think my boss had any idea either. He may have picked up on something later as things went on. But at that time, I don't think any of the senior officers were aware that the OSI was doing their thing. And it was not uncommon. They did not work for the local commander. There was sort of a dotted line, if you will. If we had a, an under drug, undercover drug activity going on and you know, surveillance, et cetera, we would know about that. If we had some misbehavior on the part of some people, we would know about that. If we had anything that was highly classified or had to do with a foreign government or something, espionage, we would not know. Okay, let's go through you know, whatever the plausible explanations are that might be put up for this. <clears throat> Could it have been a meteor or space junk or no, a satellite? No, I thought about that. In fact, a Russian satellite came down about that time, not far from us, I'm told. It couldn't have there been. There was a meteor shower. But meteors don't go back up, don't move through the trees. Could it have been ball lightning? I thought, that's the first thing I thought what I saw was ball lightning, but it lingered too long. How long were you watching it for? We're talking for several minutes. And would ball lightning move through a tree, through the trees, through the forest, and go up and down and back and forth? I don't think so, but I don't know. I've never seen ball lightning that I know. Clearly, 
after interviewing Jim Penniston and John Burroughs and Cabanasag, you were left with the possibility that what you were looking at was a presumably a highly sophisticated form of technology that's beyond what we currently understand humans to be capable of, would you? That's right. In fact, I'm thinking in my mind at that time, how am I ever going to explain this? Nobody will believe this. Well, was it crossing your mind that what you were looking at was possibly extraterrestrial? Uh, either that or from another dimension, perhaps. I don't know. I certainly had the feeling, how did I get involved in this? Why did I get involved in this? I wish I hadn't come out here. You're a sane man, aren't you? You've got no history of mental illness? No. There's no history of delusions in your family? No, none whatsoever. And yet you were seeing something that's beyond human understanding. That's correct. And I was baffled. I would like answers. I have sought out numerous people that are experts in certain fields, astrophysicists, etc., and ask them, you know, what do you think of this? What could this be? And I've never gotten a good explanation. There's been a, a considerable campaign over the years to discredit you and, and suggest that you didn't see what you say you saw, hasn't there? Yes. It's been suggested that your story has been embellished or changed as the years have gone by. I think if you go back and listen to the tape and read the statement, I think you'll find it been most consistent. Has the US government ever made a statement about what it believes happened in the forest that night? Not that I know of. I would certainly like one. Do you believe that the US government or somebody in the US government knows more than they're letting on? I suspect there's more than one agency that knows a lot more than what they're letting on. I suspect there are several intelligence agencies that actually compete in this area, along with other areas, for information, for access, share things when it's convenient, and other times don't. Do you think it suits the American government and the British government for the public to snigger whenever people talk about UFOs? Well, I think that may be part of the, how should I say, the overall scheme of things, to keep some things so ridiculous and ferment certain things in certain groups that are, how shall I say, there's a lot of people that get involved with UFOs that are certainly, how shall I say, out of the mainstream, being polite. Well, there's a few crazies, let's be well, honest about You can say that. I, I, I have saved all the correspondence and documents that have, that have come to me unsolicited and everything from I've seen the second coming of Christ, to I've been in cahoots with the devil, to you name it. There's no explanation you can think of for what you saw that night, is it? None whatsoever. I would certainly like some answers. I have a feeling I may never get answers, and it's caused a lot of problems for some of the young people that were involved. What I've learned to do is put it in a shelf. If somebody sets yourself, comes and answers, asks me questions, I try and give an honest, straightforward answer. Other than that, I'm not preoccupied. I don't go around looking in the sky. I don't go reading every UFO magazine. I don't subscribe to any. People have sent me books. I have looked through the books out of curiosity. And, you know, especially if they make reference to me, you're going, I'm going to look in the book. So. But crucially, you don't expect, do you, to ever know what happened that night? I have a, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think I'll ever have got a good answer. Why do you believe the United States government knows more than it's letting on? Well, there's, there's several reasons. Uh, one, we did an inspection of NSA several years ago when I was in a position to do so. That's the National Security Agency. Yes. And at that time, one of the, the wannabe that was supposedly involved to put himself into the scene, so to speak, and got himself embreshed, enmeshed in the middle of it all and had some medical problems. He was let go from the Air Force. This is Larry Warren. Yes. His record supposedly disappeared and he was having difficulties, which are probably, that's all probably all true. I, I don't know for a fact, but I suspect it's true. And Larry Warren called me up and said that he was going to go public. He was going to sue the Air Force or some such thing. He would go after NSA and make a big splash in the paper. At that time, we were doing an organizational inspection of NSA. So I told my team chief, who was doing the lead man, to tell his counterpart in NSA, if they had anything to do with it all, that it might be time to either come clean or, you know, plan their response. And I immediately got a call from the chief of the compromise division at NSA who knew an awful lot about it, but wouldn't admit that he knew about it. But why does that make you and my believe? team chief didn't know anything about it. So, you know, why would he didn't convey anything? So they obviously somebody somewhere had a file and had an interest. Why does that make you believe, though, that the U.S. government knows more than it's letting on? 
because the way the whole thing came down, the fact that there was a background uh, black investigation, if you will, of this whole thing, I find out later, piecing bits together. Uh, I was not informed. Most, I don't think anybody in the base, other than maybe one or two individuals were aware of it. And there was a whole lot of stuff went on in the background. Strange people showed up at the Forest Service office asking unusual questions almost immediately after the event. People that lived in the area, British citizens, had folks come to the door, you know, in trench coats, some speaking American English, if you will, asking questions. Uh, supposedly the control tower at Eastern Radar had visitors looking for tapes. All sorts of things happened in the background. The police blotters disappeared from the files. Interesting, isn't it? This is sounding disturbingly like an episode of The X-Files. Well, I hate to say it, but the, there's some very, how shall I say, skillful people in the background doing some things. And, and you believe, as a seasoned officer in the US military, that it's capable of that sort of thing? Certainly. It, you realize it's reflecting adversely on the place that you worked for for so many years. Well, unfortunately. Let's talk about radar echoes. Did you ever see or, or be briefed on any information which suggested that there was in fact a radar return on those objects that night? The, the only thing I know is the I was given the feedback from the command post when I called and asked them to check with Eastern Radar to check the location to see what they could find. I was told there was nothing there that night on the radio. However, later, several months later, I was at a party with some British friends and one of the radar operators sought me out at the party and told me he was on duty that night in the tire and they did pick up some returns that night. With, but, the, with the tapes? With, I, and he said the tapes were collected and taken by somebody. Now, I don't know if that's true, that's hearsay, but. Was he at radar operator? Yes. You're quite confident about that? Yes, yes. You see, what you're suggesting is that there's a conspiracy inside both the British and the American government to keep the story from oh, getting Oh, I don't have any doubt about it. You're sure about that? Yeah, I'm very comfortable saying that. As a colonel, you're, you're pretty much one below a general in the US Air Force, aren't you? Yes. That's a very senior rank. I mean, I'm not reflecting on you. I'm basically talking about your credibility. You're not somebody who lightly makes a criticism of the force in which you've served for so long. Well, you know, I, I honestly think I was hung out to dry too, to be honest with you, and made sound of a scapegoat and then the bogus stories planted and the false information out. And, uh... So there's been a campaign to discredit you? Certainly. And you stick to your guns? I do. One of the things that Georgina Bruni, the UFO investigator, claims is that Margaret Thatcher, soon after she was Prime Minister, said, you can't tell the people. Do you believe that there's a view that you can't tell the people? Actually, I think the, the general public would, at this point, accept the fact that there are some other type of alien beings or some other type of life form that either coexists with us or visits us. I don't think, people think, you know, you're going back to Orson Welles and his radio program when people jumped off bridges and buildings and did all sorts of stupid things because of his radio program. I don't think the public would react that way today. Why do you think there are some in the military who take the view that we need to be protected from the idea that there, there may be other alternative life forms out there in the universe? Well, I think there's two concerns. One is about the reaction of the general public, which I don't think would be that troublesome. That's number one. And number two is the fact that uh, there are, let's face it, we are in competition with other uh, adversarial countries, if you will. And there is a great deal of interest in that we need to gain as much information, technology, or the edge, so to speak, from any potential other life form. I know you don't know one way or the other what you saw that night, what it was, but do you have a gut feeling? No, I really don't. I just know that there was something somewhere that was controlling what I saw. Which is a bit scary. It certainly is a bit scary. Does it keep you awake these days? Uh, as I told you earlier, I kind of put it on the shelf. If I had to worry about it all the time, I wouldn't get anything else done. I have too many other issues in my life that I just soon get on with. Has it affected that incident the way you view the military you served so well for so many years? Well, when, when more of the story started unfolding, it, I was very disappointed, to be very honest with you. Number one, I was lied to, which is not uncommon, I guess. 
And number two, the behavior and the activities took place. I don't know. I would question the ethics, but the, that's not my position, I guess. The important thing about your case is that the newly released British archives confirm that even the skeptical British Ministry of Defence investigators couldn't explain what you saw, could they? I guess not. I still want to know why they didn't come and talk to me. They could have ordered me to shut up. They could have said, what all do you know? And, you know, tell me everything, put us in touch with everybody, and you cannot speak about this, and you and I wouldn't be here today. Have you spoken to other people in the U.S. military privately who told you about things that they've seen? I've had pe I have not searched out people. People have searched me out and sent me emails or sent me letters or called me and said, you know, I saw something similar and this, that, and the next thing. And What did they say? Uh, they've told me everything from uh, missiles being reprogrammed or missiles being taken offline mysteriously and strange objects in the sky, strange things happening to people. And uh, some of them are very credible people and they don't necessarily want it known their name or they didn't go public with it. Or in some cases, they were actually ordered to be silent, to forget anything even happened. Well, do you believe from what you saw at Rendlesham, do you believe that there is a conspiracy to cover up what's going on? I certainly believe there's a cover up. You're sure about that? Oh, I'm sure. I would certainly like to get the answers, but don't expect to. Why do you believe that there was a black secret investigation going on into what happened in the forest? Because of what the people that were interrogated, the four, five, actually five people that were interrogated independently told me, and they have most consistently held to that story that they were taken in and they told me, describe the building, that would be the right place. They were interrogated, they were given injections, they were hypnotized. There were some strange people in the room. By strange, I don't mean alien. I mean people that they didn't recognize in the room. And uh, they were walked through everything they knew. Were they told to be quiet about what they'd seen? The interesting thing is that only one, only two of them have said, one particular one said that they were given some information and shown some films or videos and told that they had to be quiet. What did the films or videos that they were shown say? Uh, they had to do with apparently alien craft of some type or something, according to them. So the witnesses that you spoke to, that you interrogated, are claiming that they were shown by members of the US military films acknowledging the existence of alien spacecraft. That's correct. What did you take away from that? Well, I was a bit still, still a bit skeptical of that because I'm not sure what kind of films we have, but I do know there's been some incidents that have been fairly well documented. At any stage, did you go to your superiors and raise with them that there'd been this alleged black investigation? No, because at that time I didn't know. It wasn't until later after I left Bentwaters that I, it all started to come out. And specifically, you'd had a denial from the man you knew from the Office of Special Investigations that there was any black right. investigation. But now you're very sure that there, there was one. Yes. In fact, uh, his number two man was identified by somebody who didn't know him specifically at that time as being one of the main participants. And he would be the guy that would come out with a rubber hose, as, that's figurative speech, you know, to work on people psychologically. What was the purpose of those interrogations? I think the purpose of the interrogation was to get the total story, to find out everything that they knew, and to plant some false impressions so that there'd be some disinformation to make the whole incident look ridiculous. The bit about little green men and repairing the craft from our avionics, with avionics components from our shops and things of that nature were just so bizarre. Why do you believe Jim Penniston when he says that he saw not just a light, but a solid, larger craft with writing on the side? Just my experience with him for several years. He'd been very credible and I'd seen him under pressure in a lot of instances and he, he held up very well. He wasn't the sort of man who made things up. No, not at all. Very serious. Are you able to say whether it's true or not that men who were involved that night were rapidly taken away from the base and relocated to other military installations? No, they weren't, as a matter of fact. Uh, and no, they weren't promoted because of it or demoted or whatever, no. 
uh, everybody that I know of rotated, I say rotated, went to another installation or another base on you know their normal time to leave. From I was there for another two years or three years. And were there any other incidents? The only other incident I know of, I was told by two security policemen, uh, occurred in Guy Fox night in uh, the following year. Supposedly an object, cigar-shaped object, lazily, as they described it, floated over Woodbridge Base, looped around a control tire, which was closed at that time, and then silently went out toward the sea. Uh, one of the patrolmen told me this much later when he was getting ready to leave the base. And I said, why didn't you come forward earlier? He said, because I saw the ridicule the rest of you went through when you were involved in the incident, and I didn't want any part of that. Let's talk hypothetically for a moment here, Chuck. Even assuming that this is a technologically sophisticated, intelligent civilization that we don't know about that's in charge of this craft, why would they come all the way to planet Earth and bob up and down over RAF bent waters? That's a good question. I can't answer that question. I've wondered that myself. Uh, there are some natural attractants in that area. That being the fact that the nuclear power plant, Sizewell, was just up the coast. The fact that uh, Orford Ness, where the lighthouse was, was where the British made their nuclear triggers during the war and did a lot of experimental work with high frequency beams uh, over the horizon radar type things. RAF Bodsey was just adjacent to us. RAF Bodsey's where all the original radar work took place during World War II and a huge installation was built. Uh, what we had on the base, there, there, there's a lot of, I would say, attractants to the area. I personally think they were attracted to the base for some reason, something that we had. You say they, because you think- I say they or it. I, just, I said it in the plural, yes, but- Whatever it was. Whatever it or, it or they was, I think was attracted to the base for some particular reason. But crucially, it was a conscious, intelligent entity. Yes, I think it was something that was doing recon work or the equivalent or doing some type of probing. There are probably people sitting at home right now wondering, is this guy for real? Well, I've <laughs> all I can say is what I saw and what I was witness to. You'll have to draw your own conclusions. Chuck, what's that? This is one of three plaster casts that was made by Jim Penniston the morning after he had the, if you will, encounter with this object. Jim was very upset and went back home. His landlord was a plasterer by trade, and he was looking for some way to make imp copies of the impression. His landlord said, let me give you some plaster of Paris, and you can go back out and make impressions. Uh -huh. So Jim went out and made, and this has been broken a little bit. It was rounder at one time. But there were three of these. This is number two. He numbered them and dated them when he made them. He gave me this later for safekeeping because one of his mysteriously disappeared, and he thinks that somebody, how shall I say, took it. Okay, what did you see that this, this, this is, impression is formed by? This is what a, a, a mold of the impression that was in the ground, the three impressions that were equal distance apart. So this there was, was a one triangle of, of a triangle these shapes. With Three impressions very similar to this. They were all, I saw the three initially when he had all three so of them. So you can confirm that this is all the shape. All three were the same shape and the same size approximately. And something had to be fairly heavy to push down into the, the sand, the soil the, that you're describing. The pretty firm sandy soil with pine needles on it. And you can see little bits of the grit from the soil. And on here, some of the pine needles that fell whenever the plaster was hardening up. So. Jim made these so that he had some physical evidence because he was firmly convinced that nobody would ever believe him and he was trying to find some way to document this and have something he could hear, see this, and that's what he did. And you believed it? I did, I did. It's an incredible thought. What could it be that made that indentation, isn't it, Chuck? I would say something probably weighed maybe a thousand pounds, maybe more to make that, with three legs to make that type of an impression. Something very heavy, obviously. Chuck, just give me an idea. Is this the tape recorder you used that night? This is the original tape recorder, the original linear tape recorder. Unfortunately, it's seen better days. It, uh, it's a senior citizen and it no longer <laughs> works properly. No. Sorry. Okay, wait again. Is that the tape recorder you were using that night? Yeah, this is the original linear. It's part of a system, actually, the dictaphone system. Uh, unfortunately, it no longer properly functions. It's a senior citizen. It's been around for a long time. Well, it's 1980 vintage. Now, much is made of you editing the tape. Is there any edits on the tape that you recorded that night? No. If you can look, you'll see record, stop, play. And all I did was play, 
Record, record, stop. So the clicks that people can hear are where you're stopping and starting. That's this little switch right here, sliding the switch. I, I mean, I use this all the time around the base. I didn't take notes or carry a pencil and paper. I carried this. I'd come back to the office and take out, here's the original tape, take out the little tape, give it to the secretary, and she would type up notes from whatever. You know, I'd go around and see things that needed to be done or activities going on. And One of the things that puzzles me though is if there was indeed electrical interference that was stopping the lights from working and stopping cameras from working, why didn't it stop your tape recorder? I don't have the slightest idea. Uh, keep in mind though, I did only use the, I did it, use it infrequently. I would turn it on, just click turn it on, record for maybe a minute, two minutes, or maybe only 10 seconds, turn it back off. Mm. Maybe the fact that this is battery operated, I don't know. Hmm. No, oh, it's a puzzle, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But um, uh, crucially, I mean, you, you've got this evidence. Do you think that without this tape, your, your claims would have been taken as seriously as they, they have Probably been? Probably not, because this tape has been analyzed to death by people, voice stress analysis, all sorts of different things, and people have made transcripts and picked at it and you know, took it all apart, sentence by sentence, word by word, he said this, she said that, they said this, etc. So, uh, yes, I think this does help some credibility. Uh, that wasn't the intent. The intent was just, hey, it's easier to use a tape recorder than it is to try and carry a notebook and a pencil. Well, you actually went into the forest that night to disprove all this, didn't I you? I certainly did. But, and I carried this routinely. I always carried it with me anywhere I went, on the base. What was it, Chuck? I don't know what it was. I know it was something under intelligent control that I can't explain. I have no idea what it was. I'd certainly like to know. Do you think you'll ever know? I have my dots, to be very honest with you. We may get more information, information may leak out of some of the investigative work that was done behind the scenes that may help put some of the pieces together, but I rather doubt we get the whole story. And you're very sure, aren't you, that someone in government is covering something up? Somebody in government knows a whole lot more than they're talking about and has done a lot of background work on this.